like to welcome everyone to the Honors Lecture Series on Veterans. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College. Uh, again, I would like to recognize Dr. Hillary Miller, who is the director of our newly established and newly inaugurated uh, MTSU Center for Vet, uh, Veterans and Veterans and Military Family Center. Uh, we had a, a grand opening this week. It was, um, well, actually, last week. Um, we had a full house. It, uh, the place was filled to capacity. Many no notable speakers. Uh, we also had a tour of the facility. It really is first rate. MTSU uh, is, is doing its very best to help veterans in every way possible. It makes me proud to be here at MTSU. So if you haven't had the opportunity to visit uh, the MTSU Veterans and Military Family Center yet, I strongly encourage you to go by. They have an open door policy. You can walk in. You don't have to be a veteran to visit the place. This is located in the bottom of the KUC. It really is a beautiful facility. Colin came in. Sure. No, he didn't. He did. Good. Colin, <laughs> your review? Very Thumbs nice. up. Okay. Was that with it? Good. So I do want to recognize uh, Dr. Miller and thank her again for partnering with me to organize this lecture series, which I think all of you will agree. Those of you who've been here for most of these lectures or all of the lectures that this has been a very successful series. And uh, so again, thank you for for coming. All right. At this time, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker, who is a colleague and friend from the English department. Dr. Jimmy Kane is professor of English and a member of the honors faculty here at MTSU. Dr. Kane is a veteran himself. His military service included uh, being in the regular army from 1973 to 1976 where he served as a crew chief door gunner on a UH-1H Huey helicopter in an air assault unit in the Louisiana National Guard from 1977 to 79, uh, where he served as a crew chief and on a Huey in an air medevac unit. Uh, he, over the years, he's taught courses here at MTSU on war and literature, and he has for many years been a strong advocate for veterans on our campus. His talk today is titled, The Combat Veteran as Monstrous Other. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kane. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you, Dr. Phillips, for inviting me. And it's good to see you all, friends and students alike. And I think today is an appropriate day for such a kind of gloomy topic, right? The veteran as a monstrous other. This has been a uh, heady few days with the opening of the new Veterans Center. NFL teams around the country are holding vet salute days, even though we're paying for them with our tax dollars right nonetheless. Uh, so veterans are being treated pretty well these days. Uh, my paper, which this talk grows out of, uh, uh, deals though with some unfortunate features of the returning home process of veterans. That veterans can sometimes be seen not as our heroes, but as our problem. And so, uh, as Dr. Phillips told you, as a veteran, uh, this is a topic that's kind of um, interested me for a number of years, and recently I was given an opportunity to do some writing about it, and that's where this project comes from. So. Um, I'm almost retired, as I like to tell Hillary all the time. I've only got two more years to go. So um, I find myself reminiscing more and more all the time and talking about the past and trying to let my students know why I do what I do. I know I'm teaching a class on modern European literature, and I started with a scene from a, a, a mass killing by the Nazis at the end of World War II, and they thought, what's that got to do with modern European lit? I said, I'll show you by the end of the semester. Okay, but we'll start a little sooner. This is my grandfather, my maternal grandfather. I think my nose is kind of like his. Not a bad looking guy, right? <laughs> Heading off to World War I. I only knew him as a weakened, withered old man in a wheelchair. He was shot in World War I and spent the last six weeks of the war in a German prisoner of war camp. 
I can still remember Thanksgiving. He loved to talk about the fact that the bread they were given was full of sawdust. I don't know if that was meant as an insult to grandmother or not, but I know he talked about it a lot. Um, wasn't a bad guy, kind of gloomy, stayed to himself a while. I always wondered what was up with grandpa. That's my father. I think I might look a little bit more like my dad. He uh, was actually serving in combat in Korea the day I was born. My mother told me a wonderful story. She got married and she spent her honeymoon night with her mother because my dad left for basic training about an hour after the wedding, so he was gone. Okay. I guess I'm his. But anyways, uh, <laughs> uh, this is my father in Vietnam. He spent uh, a year in Korea, uh, two years in Korea. He served three tours in Vietnam. Uh, you know, he died at age 47. Um, he developed alcoholism as a consequence of his military service. Uh, developed uh, malaria in Vietnam and died of liver failure at a rather young age. Uh, he and mom had a tempestuous relationship. I remember they waited till we were gone before they got divorced and our first question was, why did you wait? You know, why didn't you get it over with earlier? I think you might know this person. Uh, it's hard to believe this picture was taken 42 years ago. Have I aged that badly? I, not too bad, so, okay. Anyways, um, let me catch up with my notes here. Um, so if I can get to this without destroying everything. So how did this project come about? Well, about two summers ago, I was uh, contacted by a sociology professor of all things from the University of Kassel in Germany. And he and some graduate students and other professors were putting a book together about the fantastic and I think if what I've heard from Dr. Lutz and others, I think that first word translates as social organization or something along those lines. But it has something to do with the zombie apocalypse, so I know people will buy it. So. <laughs> um, anyways, I think they contacted me because I do have a book about Bram Stoker and Dracula. I don't like vampires. It's a new historical reading. I try to argue that vampire responds in part to anti-Russian feelings, so don't go out there and think it's, it's true blood or something like that, it's not, so. Um, but anyways, as you can see my background, I've done some publishing in American and Europe, uh, British literature. Uh, Terence Malick, anybody here a fan of his movie, The Thin Red Line? I got one person, read my article, it's a great article about it, it'll explain the whole movie, so. Uh, so I think anyways, they probably touched on the vampire bit and didn't think about the veteran bit. So I decided this would be a great opportunity to write about veterans as fantastic others. And the more I dug into it, I realized they weren't just fantastic others, but they were often monstrous others. And so in the course of putting this long article together, I spent a good deal of time looking not only at literature, at works in sociology, at works in anthropology, but art as well. Uh, matter of fact, many years ago when I first my, taught my first honors course, I took a group of about 10 honors students to the National Vietnam Veterans Art Museum in Chicago. It has now been renamed, it's the National Veterans Art Museum in Chicago. Uh, that was one of the best classes I ever had. I mean. Uh, it was a little scary keeping up with 10 honor students in Chicago for a weekend, but other than that, it worked out pretty well. Uh, so uh, that kind of embedded a seed in my mind about what I could do with some of that. So uh, what you're about to hear is from this article, so I'm gonna kind of give you a thumbnail sketch of what I wrote about, okay? Um, just a few things I discovered. This first work was written by two psychiatrists back in the 80s who were engaged in a debate about whether or not PTSD was actually a verifiable, justifiable diagnosis for veterans. We forget today that PTSD is an accepted diagnosis, that it's relatively recent there was some debate about that issue. But what struck me was the very first sentence of their article. History has shown war veterans to be a problem to society. Now these are two psychiatrists writing this. Uh, about 20 years later, two sociologists by the name of Krippner and Paulson argue that the veteran's isolation from home and community leads him or her to feel utterly abandoned and alone, cast out of the divine system that sustains life. From that moment on, a sense of alienation and disconnection pervades. I can remember back in the 70s when I went to college, I was in the veterans club, 
I, I know I've got some Bravo people out here probably, right? Got any Bravo folks? A few. Um, we were a kind of cutoff group, the Vietnam vets. Um, you know, we tried to integrate with other students, uh, and that was fine until they found out you were a veteran, and then they didn't want to hang out with you too much. Uh, you've got to remember, during this time, I remember my last year of active duty in 1976. I was stationed at Fort Riley, Kansas, and we had a dictate from the post commander, don't wear your uniform off base. Tony, do you remember that stuff? Yeah, they didn't want us to, now this is a military town, right? And they still were uncomfortable about our being off base in our uniform just because there was so much tension between civilians and soldiers at the end of Vietnam. Uh, and then a person who's gonna figure very significantly in my paper is the psychiatrist Jonathan Shea, who wrote, I shall conceal none of the ugly and hateful ways that war veterans acted toward others and themselves. To the ancient Greeks, Odysseus' name meant man of hate, he who sows trouble. And you'll notice that Dr. Shea, who's pictured there in the middle, is most famous for two works about Vietnam veterans. He worked extensively with Vietnam veterans. Um, he is actually today the chief uh, consultant for the Defense Department on PTSD issues. He's pretty much helped to create the protocols. Uh, those of you who are veterans out here, maybe served in Iraq and Afghanistan, when you come back now, you come back as a unit, you probably have a period where you go someplace and you're allowed to decompress for a couple of weeks or a month before you're allowed to return to your duty station. In Vietnam, you got on a plane and joined a unit in Vietnam, and if you lived, you came back by yourself, maybe with some other veterans from different units. There was none of this cohesion, unit cohesion, that exists today. It's because of people like Dr. Shea that we have these methodologies we now use. His first book, Achilles in Vietnam, deals very much with the trauma experienced by soldiers in combat. His second book, Odysseus in America, Combat Trauma and the Trials of Homecoming, is very much as the title suggests. How do these soldiers bring the war back with them when they return home? Was and, uh, I'm sorry? Uh, no, he was not. He was not a veteran. Uh, as you probably can tell by the titles of those two books, one thing I like about Jonathan Shea is that he combines literature as well as psychiatry. He's taken a look at the Iliad and the Odyssey and tried to use Achilles in one book and Odysseus in another as metaphors for the experiences of the typical veteran coming back from Vietnam. And by extension, I would argue almost any war. Uh, he deals with three terms, three Greek terms, themis, thumis, and gaster, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing these correctly. <clears throat> in Achilles in Vietnam, he argues the major source for trauma for many combat veterans was the breakdown in themis, the trust that those in authority would operate according to the principle of what's right. I'll give you a couple of examples of this. How many of you have heard of Milai? What happened at Milai? March the 8th, 1968. U.S. Army Patrol um, sweeping through our uh, rural hamlet at Milai, a series of villages, and they were look, searching for Viet Cong insurgents in the wake of the Tet Offensive when you know, the VAC had completely caught by surprise. And so they were on high order, feeling nervous. And in the end, I think, uh, with second, was it second lieutenant William Cowell? William Cowell, yeah. Specifically, uh, and his men began rounding up villagers and shooting them. Absolutely correct. Uh, on March the 8th, 1968, in South Vietnam at the village of My Lai Four, a uh, unit of the American Americal Division, a very famous infantry division that had fought alongside the Marines in the Pacific Campaign, went into a village that was uh, pretty much um, depopulated of young men who had either died, been incarcerated, joined the Viet Cong, uh, uh, and rounded up about 450 children, old men, and old women, and shot them. And we have a whole series of pictures. In one picture, American soldiers are eating lunch amongst dead Vietnamese bodies. In another picture, there's a group of Vietnamese women and children crying and begging to their lives taken moments before they were all machine gunned. This was an instance of a breaking of Themis. These soldiers had been told. They were told up until the moment of their engagement with these villagers, this is an enemy enclave. 
you are going to be confronting enemy soldiers. So these men were led to do their duty, but their duty was a lie in a sense, what they were told to do. Um, the same thing could be seen if you take a look at uh, Dispatches, uh, that, that uh, wonderful book about uh, Vietnam written from the point of view of a journalist who talks about the five o'clock follies. Every day at five o'clock at MACV, Military Assistance Command Vietnam, a press conference would be given by the command in which rosy statistics were always issued. We're winning the war, we're winning hearts and minds. Uh, you contrast that with what the author calls the grunt narrative, the point of view of the soldier in the field who will tell you we are not winning hearts and minds, we are not winning defeating the enemy, we are going back through the same town again and again and again and again and having to re-liberate, re-liberate, re-liberate. We are not being told the whole truth. And so what happens in Vietnam uh, is you have this notion that somehow I'm being lied to. Uh, the way we handle deployments hurt too. Officers in the infantry in Vietnam served six months in combat and then they were rotated back to the rear. Enlisted men served the entire year or to, uh, to a point where they were injured or killed. Officers rotated out more quickly, so what does that mean? Every six months you got a new, brand new butter bar second lieutenant who didn't know anything out there telling you, let's walk down this trail. I'm not going to walk down that trail, it's booby trapped. There's landmines, there's snipers, okay? So who do you trust? Well, later on in uh, his second book, Odysseus in America, he contends that Vietnam veterans on the return home failed to receive proper care and attention because of the opposition between Thumos and Gaster, between different, different civilian perceptions of the men they send to fight for them and the men who return home to them. When we are in fear of the enemy, nothing is too much or too good for the great-hearted spirit, Thumos, of our fighting men. When they return as veterans, we see their needs as greedy, demanding, uncultivated belly, or gaster. And I can remember in the 70s a whole series of movies like Coming Home, Taxi Driver, all about the uh, violent Vietnam vet or the injured Vietnam vet, the vet who couldn't figure back into or fit back into society. Okay. So we get this split. And this is how he builds his argument. So, in the series of making this argument, Dr. Shea comes up with about 10 chapter headings to deal with different problems that he sees confronting veterans. I focused on three. Odysseus among the rich civilians, pirate raids staying in combat mode, and witches, goddesses, queens, wives, dangerous women. So what are these things? Well, in um, the section on Odysseus among the rich civilians, he asks some important questions. How do veterans interact with those who stayed behind? Now, in Vietnam, I remember we all had draft numbers. I, I'll never forget my senior year in high school in April. We all sat around in our homeroom watching a bunch of men my age now, I have a bit more hair than they did, uh, turning a big barrel. What were they turning that big barrel for, Dr. Johnson? They were plucking out numbers. They were pl plucking out dates from the calendar, choosing who would get drafted. So we all felt like we had a stake in that war in a way. Today, there is no draft. Today, we have an all-volunteer military. And so uh, it may be a little less common to have some connection with the civilians when you're returning home. What is it, uh, Hillary? One-tenth of one percent of Americans actually serve less in the military than, now? Less than one percent of our population fights all our wars for us now. So this disconnect that Shea saw in these Vietnam vets may actually be exacerbated now, right? Um, let me go back. In his second question, uh, Pirate Raid, what leads to high concentrations of uh, incarceration rates amongst veterans? Why are relationships between veterans and their spouses often tumultuous and difficult? Is it that they've inculcated certain tendencies and behaviors in combat that are hard to shed once you return home? And finally, witches, goddesses, queens, wives, dangerous women. Um, how do vets bring trauma home? 
What about their interaction with women in the front can maybe affect their interaction with women at home? So here we go. Odysseus Among the Rich Civilians. I started my research, oddly enough, going back and looking at a famous book from 1975 by Paul Fussell. Paul Fussell was a famous 18th century uh, scholar of British poetry. He was also a second lieutenant in World War II and served in an infantry platoon in, uh, in Europe. Uh, wrote a very famous book after, uh, after he'd been at Harvard a few years uh, called Wartime in which he points out uh, a little, uh, one of my favorite chapters in that book, and excuse my language, Dr. Phillips, he writes about the difference between chicken shit and bullshit. What is the difference between chicken shit and bullshit? Well, let's use the NFL. What happens to a player if he wears the wrong color socks? He gets a fine. What happens to the New England Patriots if they cheat? <laughs> Nothing, right? Okay, so chicken shit, you pay a fine for it. Bullshit, you get away with it, right? Anybody who's been in the military ever dealt with bullshit? What's your gig line? You ever get points taken off because your shirt, your belt, and your fly weren't all in the same line? Well, anyways, that's chicken shit, okay? So anyway, but uh, this is a book he wrote specifically about World War I British poets. And he had some interesting observations. Look at this first observation. It was not just from their command staffs that the troops felt estranged. It was from everyone back in England. You know, what was interesting about that war is if you were in Piccadilly Circus during the Battle of the Somme, you could actually hear the shells going off across the, British, the English Channel in France. The soldiers in the trenches could think about the dance halls back home. That division was as severe and uncompromising as the others generating the adversary atmosphere. The visiting of violent and a painful uh, death upon the complacent, patriotic, and uncomprehending, I love this, fatuous civilians at home was a favorite fantasy indulged by the troops. Siegfried Sasson, anybody familiar with Siegfried Sasson, very famous World War I poet, once commented that he would like to see these fatuous civilians lounging in relative comfort at home, quote, crushed to death by a tank in one of their silly patriotic music halls. So not a lot of love for the civilians amongst the soldiers, right? Uh, Henri Barbusse, famous writer who served in the French army uh, in World War I. Uh, writing about a, a scene where the troops have been taken out of the line and, and, and brought to a small village behind the lines to re-equip and to rest. The sight of this world has revealed a great truth to us at last, a great difference which becomes evident between human beings, a difference far deeper than that of nations and with defensive trenches more impregnable, the clean-cut and truly unpardonable division that there is in a country's inhabitants between those who gain and those who grieve, those who are required to sacrifice all, all to give their numbers and strength and suffering to the last limit, those upon whom the others walk, advance, smile, and succeed. Not a lot of love for your civilians here, right? A book that I spend a great deal of time with, uh, about half of the article deals with uh, Remark, uh, the other half deals with a series of American Vietnam veteran authors. Uh, the Road Back, though, 1931, anybody remember Eric Maria Remarque's uh, most famous novel? All quiet. All quiet on the Western Front, absolutely correct. About his days in service in the military, this is about the return. And so this is a scene early in the book. They've been demobilized. They've been brought back to Germany. They're expecting to be embraced by the civilian population. They're expecting to be loved, cherished, and thanked. This is what happens instead. Let's just Lee retrudge on one. We had pictured our entry into our own country after the long years out there rather differently. We imagined people would be waiting for us, expecting us. Now we see they've all taken on their own affairs. They have moved on and are still moving on, leaving us behind almost as if we were superfluous already. So right off the bat, as he says, it leaves us with a queer foreboding. There's a grain of sand irritating, making that division between civilian and soldier even more pronounced. One thing that really angered Ernst, the 
protagonist in this book, The Road Back, was not only those who didn't have to go to the front, but those who not only stayed in the rear and lived comfortably, but who profited off the war as well. And one of the characters who profit from the war is his uncle, Uncle Carl, who's a bureaucrat in the, uh, he's a bureaucrat with the military working in logistics and material or supply. He works on the supply side, the quartermaster corps. And so Uncle Carl invites him to dinner. This is a scene at that dinner. He embarrasses himself. Okay, he's been living in the trenches, eating God only knows what. And finally, he's back in the rear, and they're serving pork chops. And so he immediately goes for those pork chops. He puts his elbow up on the table. He's got grease all over his face, and he's embarrassed because all these civilians are eating there politely with knives and forks. Here's a guy who's had to learn to eat between ducking shell fire, try, keeping rats off his food, whatever it might be. So embarrassment, anger against his Uncle Carl, now beginning to talk so loudly of war loans. Anger against all these people here that think so much of themselves and their smart talk. Anger against this whole world, living here so damn cocksure with knickknacks and jiggery-pockery as though the monstrous years had never been one thing and one thing only mattered. Life and death and nothing beyond that. There's a woman at the dinner with him whose husband's died in the war. She doesn't have a word to say about him. It's all about how life's been so bad for her back in the rear. Uh, a little later, uh, Ernst is out on the town. You have to remember, Weimar Germany, right after World War I, was a very hungry place. The Allies had blockaded Germany for four years. By the end of the war, like my grandfather told me, they were eating bread mixed with sawdust just to make it stretch further. Um, also, there was hyperinflation. Anybody know what the hyperinflation was? Uh, inflation is when money loses its value. Hyperinflation is when it loses its value so drastically that you can take the wages home with people who are going to lose their own Absolutely correct. There's a very famous picture of two German kids. They're about that tall. There's a stack of money behind them about that tall. That's what a loaf of bread costs. Yeah, so money is worthless. Hunger is rampant. And yet the war profiteers have their own little clubs, their own little bars where soft, warm light spills over the tables, long trailers of bluish cigar smoke floating through it, carpets glowing, shining porcelain, gleaming silver, women seated at the table surrounded by waiters and beside them men who do not appear to be sweating, sweating the least, nor are they even embarrassed with what wonderful self-possession they give their orders. And thankfully, some German soldiers were great artists and came back and painted pictures that capture this kind of animosity they held for people such as this bureaucrat in George Gross's Gray Day, 1921. Uh, let me read you a little bit from the wonderful book where I found this. this is called Glitter and Gloom, uh, uh, written by a woman by the name of Rewald. Uh, and this is what she has to say. An amputee mi missing his right arm, the veteran depicted as Gray Day, is one of approximately 24,083 veterans who lost arms. Another estimated 54,953 lost one leg or both legs. Appropriately, this picture is inspired by an event that occurred three years earlier in 1918 when a mob of war cripples had marched to the war ministry in Berlin demanding treatment that had been promised by the government but not delivered. The one uh, amputee inhabiting Gross's stark cityscape ambles toward the right of the frame, still clad in his army uniform. Um, and supported by a walking stick in his left hand. The other figures include a faceless industrial uh, worker carrying a shovel as he trudges toward the factory, dominating the foreground as a figure of particular distaste to Dix, the bureaucrat. For gross, I mean for gross. For gross, bureaucrats were, quote, interchangeable villains, whether they wore steel helmets, officers' caps, or, as here, bureaucrats, too tight bowler hats. This singular specimen is very disturbing. This municipal officer looks stupid 
narrow-minded and smug. His crossed piglet's eyes behind the pince-nez see no further than the tip of his fleshy nose. Dueling scars evoke past fraternity days. The imperial colors of the black, white, and red ribbon on his lapel and mustache in the style worn by exiled Kaiser stamp him as a reactionary nationalist. As another critic has said, this painting shows uh, what Gross believed to be the ugly, obese, dumb, and arrogant faces of those he signaled out as the million of people who exist so mindlessly, so unable, so unable to see what is really happening, people who have had the wool pulled over their eyes ever since their school days, whose minds have been stuffed with the attributes of ignorant reaction, such as God, fatherland, and militarism. And of all these types, the ones he most despised were military men, industrialists, clergymen, newspapermen, politicians, and unfortunately, teachers. Why teachers? You've read, those of you who've read All Quiet on the Western Front, why does Paul Baumer go to war? Anybody remember? His teacher talks him into it. Ah, got to look out for those teachers, right? Okay, so here's one image. Here's another image by Gross. This is called, I shall exterminate everything around me that restricts me from being the master. Wow, what a title. Uh, here's another industrialist. Uh, and as uh, someone has said, the fat, vulgar factory owner with the snout of a pig and the neck of a bull shown here epitomizes the industrialist who grew rich and powerful by producing weapons or other material for war. One hand rests on his fat paunch, the other holds a cigar evoking a penis. Faceless laborers toil in the background. Another, pimps of death. Interestingly enough, we have two rather poor sign figures in uniform in the foreground. If you look in the background in this alley, we've got uh, skeletons wearing the fatigue caps of the German army dressed in uh, robes. Interestingly enough, these two figures in the foreground are the two principal architects of Germany's war, Ludendorff and Hindenburg. So is it becoming, yes sir? I was curious, these pictures the most are drew, um, I'm going to assume they were fairly popular among the veterans of the war. Is, is, is this the sort of caricature that Al Hitler had to draw around German Jews and communists? Probably, I, w I would think so. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and you have to remember there's a wonderful book called The Culture of Defeat by a guy named Chivalbush. And he talks about something that Hitler used, that Southerners used in 1865, and that uh, the French used in 1871, the stab in the back myth. Hitler uses the Jews stabbed us in the back uh, in World War I because as it turned out, if we go back, unfortunately, many of these people, particularly this guy, uh, would probably be seen by Hitler as Jewish, yeah. the wealthy industrialists. Yeah. Well, it's not just World War I in Germany, it's Vietnam. Here is a painting from what used to be the National Vietnam Veterans Art Museum, now the National Veterans Art Museum, by Scott Neistat called War Games. Um, what strikes you about this painting? What about the four people arrayed before you? They're really garish and ugly, and they're all wearing over. And they're poor sign, right? They're fat pigs, the command staff. Um, you'll notice we have, looks like someone probably from an African dictatorship, the Pentagon, Red China, uh, probably another potentate from uh, an Asian dictatorship. They're playing what looks like Monopoly, but if you look closer, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, uh, instead of other, Park Place, you've got uh, blocks called Hanoi Hilton, the notorious prison where John McCain was kept. Uh, if you look at the cars they're dealt, get out of the Hanoi Hilton, assigned to the 101st Airborne. So that, what's the implication here for the generals? What are the soldiers? Cards to be dealt in a game. 
Uh, this is another piece from the National Veterans Art Museum in Chicago by David Allen Sessions called Contained War. And what he tries to do here is juxtapose the life of the rich civilians against the life of the combatants. And he just crams them together. Here's a poor guy, possibly Green Beret, possibly Navy SEAL, uh, sweating, agonizingly trying to either evade attack or engage the enemy, next to a buxom blonde wearing pearls. We have a family here arrayed to go on vacation with their suitcases. Behind them, the detritus of war. A Marine looking perhaps aggrieved at the loss of someone or injured, standing in a very comfortable living room in front of what was at the time an expensive color TV. Are these separate pictures? These are separate pictures that are all put together in this one composite okay. piece. Yeah. Okay, so clearly then I think you can see there is some tension between veteran and civilian, between command and uh, you know the lesser infantry uh, members such as enlisted men and sergeants. Another feature though of this tension is that often the vet comes back as a grotesque figure. This is from a book called Weimar Promise and Tragedy by Eric Weiss in 2007. Roughly two million German men were killed. Two million. 4.2 million wounded. 19 percent of the entire male population were direct casualties of the violence of war. Many of the survivors lived the rest of their lives with appalling physical and psychological wounds. The war wounded, mask covering faces that had been blown away, dark glasses covering blinded eyes, wheelchairs replacing the gait of the walker were everywhere visible in the streets of Germany. Just some random pictures uh, about the various types of uh, physical deformities, uh, people who had lost eyes, or had lost vision, people whose faces have been reduced to what looks like a lump of ground meat. For people with really terrible facial uh, injuries, masks were made. A group of German World War I veterans bathing after the war. Look how many missing legs we have here. This is perhaps one of the most famous pictures uh, by a German artist, Otto Dix, which tries to capture the severity of the injuries, of the grotesqueness of these soldiers uh, who've come back from war. I just want to read one thing quickly to you about this. The painted ersatz blue cloth of the jacket of the player who wears the on cross. The mechanical jaw replacement. He's lost his jaw, so they've made him one out of tinfoil. The black eye patch covering an absent nose. The huge motionless glass eye. The stitched on rubber patch showing a copulating couple. The spiffy hairdos confected from patches of hair, the starch white collars and ties, and nubby twee of two figure suits. One player sports a, a cuff link on the shirt sleeve he wears on his leg which serves as an arm. As you can see, none of them have legs. These were very common sights. Grotesque to the viewer, and I'm certain grotesque in some ways to the bearer of these injuries. Vietnam, the same problem. Here's a, a sculpture from the Vietnam Veterans, or the National Veterans Art Museum from 1979 by Randolph Harmes called Ritual Suicide Mask. He has a whole series and they're made of wood. He's actually got inlaid. I don't know where he got the enamel teeth. Uh, gauze. And these are meant to show physically the wounds that these veterans carry and I guess figuratively the psychological scars they carry. Richard Yonka, this is how you died. This is a painting that deals specifically with someone who's dying in combat but all of his paintings, he has a whole series of these of people in civilian life and they've all been reduced to skeletons barely clad with muscle. They've been, it's like they've been reduced to their essence with no exterior. The survivor, the survivor of combat and the survivor who carries the mental scars of PTSD. 
So I tried to mix art and literature, and so then I turned to literature. Paco's story, Larry Heineman, 1979 National Book Award. And he has a character who uh, actually uh, has, uh, the, the novel just opens up, he's getting off a bus, he's looking for a job, he's just been let out of the VA hospital. Somebody sees him on the bus, she sees his cane, she sees that look he's got in his eyes, those points of pins, reminds her of her son who was a Korean War veteran, somebody who was always thought of as lazy and no count and who had for the rest of his life lapsed into a deep and permanent melancholy. This reminds me of a friend I had in high school, very good athlete, very handsome guy. He was very popular with, uh, excuse my sexism, with the ladies. Okay, so he was very popular. When he came back from Vietnam, he started living in his car. Only thing I ever saw him meet was a can of sardines every now and then. Just couldn't talk to anybody, couldn't deal with anybody. He had a permanent melancholy. Uh, and then when he actually goes to apply for a couple of jobs, when Paco, Paco does, these are the kind of remarks that people say behind his back. That cane, those rough and clothes, that funny look in the eyes, they all got it, don't they? There's something about those Vietnam vets. And then another man who turns him away and doesn't offer him a job says, them Vietnam boys sure do think you owe them something, don't they? Uh, Paco storing the grotesque veteran. Paco is very damaged. Looks like somebody had taken off after him with one of those long-handled mallets you tenderize meat with. He had razor-thin surgical scars, bone fragment scars, uh, puckered burn scars, um, dead and discolored ring of skin at the medius part. When he tries to move, the pain shoots straight up his legs and his thighs and his backs and his arms the tips of his fingers tingle. So he is a, an embodiment of the grotesque soldier. Pirate raids, staying in combat mode. According to Shea, having left the combat zone physically, some veterans may simply remain in combat mode, although not necessarily against the original enemy. He contends that during combat, soldiers learn a set of skills that sets them apart from most civilians. These include the capacity to respond skillfully and instantly with violent and lethal force, as well as perpetual vigilance and mobilization for danger. Shea also echoes something that Philip Caputo writes in his very famous memoir of Vietnam, A Rumor of War. The communion between combatants is as profound as any between lovers. Actually, it is more so. It does, does not demand for its sustenance the reciprocity, the pledges of affection, the endless reassurances. Unlike marriage, it is a bond that cannot be broken by a word, by boredom or divorce, or anything other than death. Uh, this is a work I turn to in the, my studies. It's a, another uh, work produced by a psych psychiatrist. And he's telling the story of an Iraqi war veteran who comes back manifesting the tendencies of staying in combat mode. So he starts digging holes. He makes a plastic structure so he can take his trash out without being observed. He's very jumpy. Couldn't even go to Walmart uh, because he couldn't check all the doors. Before he went to Iraq, he wasn't that way. And I can remember uh, what a little bit of my dad I remember and my grandfather. They were always quite jumpy. They were always nervous. Whenever they sat someplace, they liked to sit so they could have the door right there so they could get out. They were always nervous about something. So going back to um, remark, I won't read all of this to you, but something that's very common is, as I was saying, these, many of these veterans have a kind of spatial acuity. Whenever they walk into a room or into an enclosed area, they think about where is the safest place. Paul Fussell, the guy I read to you from before, who was a professor at Harvard many years, and in his memoir, he has a description of there was this particular part of Boston he drove through, and every time he drove through that part of Boston, he thought about, boy, and a, a machine gun emplacement would look really good right there at that corner by the gas station. Yeah, I could protect the corner there. Uh, but yeah, so here you have Ernst out for a walk trying to relive some of his youth amongst uh, the beauties of nature. And all he can think about is where he would place trenches and weapons. Uh, Many veterans also have dreams of this service. There's a famous scene in the novel where he's having a dream that he's being attacked by an Englishman. Uh, 
wakes up to realize it's just a dream. Unfortunately, he knocks down the poor farmer who's housing him right and standing over him. And then just like uh, Philip Caputo, who wrote about the love between combatants, he writes about how the only time he feels good is when he's with a fellow vet. Stephen Wright, who was a Vietnam vet, uh, touches on some of the same ideas. He has a difficulty maintaining the barrier between uh, kind of fact and fancy between when I'm here, when I'm back in Vietnam. And I won't read all this to you, but you can see he often has to struggle with coming out of dreams of being in combat and yet being out of combat. So he's in his room and gradually the bunker would melt back into the desk. The chair would lower its weapon. When dawn came at last, filling the room with fluid light, I would drift off into an uneasy imitation of sleep. Witches, goddesses, queens, and wives, dangerous women. Shea argues that combat veterans commonly manifest hostility and habitual disrespect toward women. These negative attitudes toward women are a continuing obstacles to veterans feeling at home. He observes that often the cause for this is that many young men who serve in combat had their first sustained experience with sex in the demeaning and dangerous context of prostitution. This was particularly bad in Vietnam uh, because there was a uh, often circulated rumor that Vietnam prostitutes were often members of the enemy. And excuse this, this is a bit graphic, but the rumor was that they kept razor blades in their vaginas to do American uh, soldiers harm, should they ever frequent a Vietnamese prostitute. Uh, going back to uh, Remark, uh, this is a scene uh, recounted when he's actually still in the war and he's come back to the back lines and they've actually got a brothel set up for the troops. This doesn't look much like love, does it? The room reeked of carbolic and sweat. There was a dish with pink water. The woman was fat and had on a short transparent chemise. She did not look at me, but straight away lay down. If that's your only relationship with sex, what happens when you come back to civilian life? And this is taken from a scene later in the novel when he's back at home. Uh, even if he could take a woman out, what would he do? I wouldn't even have the faintest notion of how to begin. Not that I'm altogether ignorant of women, of course, but what do I know I learned from war with such ladies as these that would clearly never do? So as you can imagine, after World War I, there was a whole series of paintings about <laughs> prostitutes. Here's Otto Dix, three prostitutes. Um, how many men died? Remember the number I gave you a little while ago? Two million. That meant there were many wives, daughters, and mothers who were without sons, without fathers, without brothers. Germany was bankrupt. Million of women, millions of women were thrown into prostitution. As a matter of fact, prostitution was so rampant after World War I in Germany that there is a, a relatively new book called Voluptuous Panic, in which he, uh, the author records and documents that there were eight varieties of outdoor prostitutes and nine varieties of indoor prostitutes. Wow, a whole, whole taxonomy, right? Three prostitutes. You can see this one's holding something that looks like a red phallus in her hand. It's an umbrella. Three winches. Dr. Phillips, this is supposed to be a parody of the three graces. They certainly don't look like the three graces to me. So you can see the jaundiced view that these troops have of women because of their experiences. This painting is particularly disturbing and particularly interesting to me because you've got kind of a mixture of everything I've talked about so far. Here are your war profiteers, comfortable, well-dressed, well-fed. Here's a veteran at the entrance to this nightclub. You can tell he's missing a leg, crude crutches. Here's another veteran over here in this panel. You can tell he's missing most of his face. He doesn't have a nose. He's holding uh, a basket asking for money from these prostitutes who are streaming down to the dance. None of them will give him anything. This is, a, this is a triptych. It's kind of like it's based on an old medieval church painting. And it shows you what's happened to your veterans. They've been pushed aside for the voluptuousness of the civilians. 
Uh, I won't read all this to you, but I'm going back to Vietnam now, and um, there is a um, young lady who's the granddaughter of the people who own the apartment complex where Paco lives, and she loves to tease Paco. She loves to flirt with him, to entice him to her room, but not let him in. She's right next door to Paco, and so she engages in these kind of violent sexual forays with her boyfriend, pounding against the wall, just so she can tease that gimp, the vet. My favorite uh, rendering from the Vietnam, or the, the uh, Veterans Art Museum, Dress to Kill. Wow, you women are dangerous. Yes, it has probably an Asian face, but that stands out, doesn't it? That suggests a not so comfortable relationship with women. The Castrator, 1983. Notice how a very attractive Vietnamese woman is situated right in the middle. Here's a corpse, an M60 machine gun, a body bag being pulled over a victim. Somehow women are complicit in the whole thing. Children reach in playing canned food in the fence. Notice these women. The come hither look, the exposed underwear, the spread legs as though prepared for penetration. What are they doing? Are they trying to lead these American soldiers away? Maybe lead them into an ambush? Maybe help the VC or the NVA get away? And you're not free from it either. This is your world, not mine. Who are these people? Dr. Lavery? Boardwalk Empire. Boardwalk Empire. When, when did it go off the air? Last year? Last year. Bill Harrow, World War I vet. He'd been a sniper. Tell me about his face. He's lost half his face in combat, and that's a prosthesis covering his face. You know this one, right? True Blood. Bill Monroe, a vampire. How did he become a vampire? Something to do with the Civil War, right? So that's it. Any questions? Didn't a woman change him as well during the Civil War? Yeah, he was dead. And he hated him. I'm not a True Blood fan. I can't tell you. I just know that I, somebody still, I think Dr. Lavery told me he was a Civil War vet. And I thought, oh, there's another one of those vets, right? So, yeah. Yeah, he was friends with female vets. Yeah. Yeah, and I was going to show you, but stuff you would know, like uh, First Blood, Sylvester Stallone, right? Right? Uh, all those characters. So, uh, did that make any sense to you at all? Yes, sir. Any questions about? Yes, sir. Okay, so do you think the Clint Eastwood's film American Sniper is a sincere effort to unravel and take the world? I'll be honest with you, I haven't watched it. Uh, I. Uh, I will, eventually, but it might be. It might be an effort, yeah. Uh, and I'm glad you brought up Clint Eastwood because I, I go to length about movies in the article. And he made a series of those Dirty Harry movies back in the 70s, which all the villains were Vietnam vets. Yeah, about four of those Dirty Harry movies, the villains are Vietnam vets. Yes, sir. Um, did you personally experience any of this, any of these hardships? Uh, well, I, d I never served in combat. I was, now, I did almost lose my life. I mean, any time you're in the military, you go on a training exercise, you can lose your life, right? I put about 1,000 hours in helicopters, and we almost crashed a few times. But I had plenty of friends um, who manifested these problems. My own father. Uh, my mother and father had a love-hate relationship of er any two people ever did. And I think in a great deal it had to be for the trauma he brought back from Korea and Vietnam, and probably the relationships he had, maybe sexual relationships he had in combat that uh, he brought back with him as well. I hope that answered. Yes, sir. A lot of these, um, all of this lecture was about historical, uh, an historical context for combat veterans. To what extent do you believe these problems still exist today in the same I'm glad you brought that. As a matter of fact, I, uh, I end the 
I end the article with the line, what are going to be the long-term consequences for Iraq and Afghanistan vets who come back and have to deal with the rich civilians? who come back and can't get out of combat mode, and who come back and have relationships with what Shea called the dangerous women. Even though we're a much more appreciative society now than we were back during Vietnam, or that Germany was after World War I, I think we're still going to see a lot. And I would think talking to my friends here who work in the Veterans Center, you actually have facilities to deal with people who struggle yeah, with these issues. Absolutely. Yeah. Full -time person start and I think one reason it's the military and family yeah. members is because the family is suffering. They're not only suffering because that veteran's away from home, they're suffering because he or she came home too. So I, I think they may not be as pronounced as they were because I focus mainly on wars that were failures. And uh, I have a great passage from that guy, Chivalbush, I mentioned, who talked about the way we think about soldiers who come back from a failed war. We kind of lose trust in them in a way. But I'm not, I, I don't think it's over. I think it may not be to the same extent, but I think we'll see some of the same problems.